uh, everyone, depending on where you are. Thank you for joining us here today for Fish and Richardson's Insights Litigation Webinar Series. Uh, as you heard, uh, my name is Ahmed Davis, uh, and I have with me my uh, partner. Steve Marshall, and we will be discussing uh, patent reform in the federal judiciary. Uh, Steve and I are both principals here in the Washington, D.C. office of FISH, uh, and I'm told that for those of you who may be interested who don't know us already, uh, our biographies will appear on the side uh, of your screen. Uh, if you are joining an Insights webinar for the first time, this monthly series explores cases and trends and provides perspectives about key legal developments and litigation strategies across intellectual property, commercial, and white-collar practice areas. Uh, we are excited to have you join us today, uh, and we invite you to mark your calendars for our next meeting, uh, which will be June 17th uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern, where we will be discussing appeals from IPRs. Uh, that webinar will be featured by our colleagues John uh, Dragseth and Lauren Degnan, uh, both of whom are also principals at Fish and Richardson. Uh, we hope you can join uh, for that webinar as well. Uh, today's webinar will run approximately for one hour. Uh, it will include uh, a short question and answer period uh, at the end of the program. Uh, you can also ask questions uh, at any time throughout the program by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Uh, to submit your question. Uh, Steve and I will be clicking through slides as we're speaking, so we will do our best to try to answer your questions either as they come in or at the end of the presentation, uh, time permitting. Uh, to the extent that we are unable to do that, uh, one or both of us will certainly follow up with you offline, uh, either by email or a call. Uh, also, of course, you should feel free to contact us personally uh, after the webinar if that's easier and you'd like to have further discussion. Uh, let me also note just briefly uh, that we are here in my office in the Washington, D.C. office, and to the extent that you may hear uh, a garbage truck in the, in the alley uh, below us or a siren going by, those are not sound effects. Those are actually things happening, and so we may take a, a brief pause to let those sounds uh, go by. Uh, finally, uh, before we get started uh, proper here, uh, I just want to remind everyone uh, that the content of this presentation is for uh, educational purposes only for the CLE uh, and does not necessarily reflect the opinions or the views of FISH, and it is also not intended to address uh, every court or case situation that we, we deal with. Uh, and so with that, uh, let's, let's move into uh, our program. Uh, we will start with uh, an overview of the slides, uh, and Steve will give an introduction. Uh, we'll cover uh, the expansion of, of patent eligibility more generally, some discussion about the patent eligibility pendulum swinging back from a 101 standpoint, uh, talk some about Alice, uh, the case itself. We'll move to attorney fees under Section 285, spend some time talking about potential intersections for Alice uh, and Octane uh, and some things that we see looking ahead and then leave some time at the end uh, for questions. Uh, and so with that, let me turn it over to Steve uh, as we begin. Greetings, everyone. Uh, this is Steve Marshall. So um, by way of introduction today, we're going to look at how the, the scope of patent eligibility has changed over the last 35 years. And to do so, we'll, we'll briefly touch on uh, legislative reform, but really focus on uh, judicial reform. And then, of course, we'll do some compare and contrast of these approaches uh, throughout the program. We're also going to look at changes to the exceptional case standard vis-a-vis uh, -vis Octane. And then finally, we're going to consider how and why these changes intersect to address some of the challenges uh, that we face in patent litigation. So starting with uh, legislative reform, over the last 20 years, we've seen an increase in patent cases. Uh, certainly the complexity and costs uh, involved in those cases have also been on the rise, and that's really been spurred on by um, 
the increased number of NPEs and the lawsuits that they're bringing. Of course, Congress tried for several years to address this, but really lacked enough momentum uh, until the AIA was passed in 2011. Uh, properly, of course, the AIA is the Leahy Smith America Invents Act. It was uh, signed in, in 2011 uh, with the main provisions effective in September 2012. Um, this has largely been considered the most substantial change to, to the Patent Act since the 1952 reform, and, and notably, uh, the administration said that the AIA, amongst other things, would help to address unnecessary litigation. Further, uh, you know, we see uh, the goals of the AIA in the statement by uh, Senator Leahy when, when the bill was signed into law. Uh, the senator highlighted two particular goals of the AIA. One was to improve the quality of patents, and the other was to provide more certainty in litigation. Now, how did these goals manifest in the AIA? <clears throat> well, certainly we've seen greater scrutiny in the PTO through measures such as the post-grant review, third-party uh, prior art submissions, uh, and the other uh, post-grant review processes. And we've also seen uh, in the AIA provisions to reduce the complexity of cases. Some of these um, provisions, of course, will take more time to come into effect as um, they apply to patents granted after the law was enacted. Of course, the courts have also engaged in reform, and today we're going to focus on three very important cases that have done that, Mayo, Alice, and Octane Fitness, and we'll consider their impact on patent litigation. Now, as a bit of a preview, it's notable that um, during the two years after the enactment of the AIA, uh, there was actually a rise in patent lawsuit filings. Now, of course, many of you know that one of the provisions um, limited the joinder of defendants in patent infringement suits, but even controlling for that disaggregation, there's still been a rise in the total number of filings in that, in that period. Now, looking to the judicial reforms, the period of a more recent judicial reform um, under Alice and Octane, there's actually been, according to recent studies, a decline in overall filings and a trend uh, for earlier uh, case resolution. Now, what this indicates is really that the, the court's changes to patent eligibility and fee shifting standards have had a substantial impact on litigation and arguably even more so than AIA. Okay, so looking at uh, patent eligibility, First, we want to cover um, what is really a period of expansion of patent eligible subject matter, um, followed in the last decade or so by um, a, a, a shrinking of that, of that scope over time. And what better way uh, to start than to, to look to the statute itself? Of course, patent eligibility is defined by 35 U.S.C. 101. <clears throat> this statement of patent eligible subject matter um, has changed actually very little since the Patent Act of 1793 um, at its very beginning. Um, and <laughs> interestingly, uh, much of the original wording penned by Thomas Jefferson uh, remains intact in today's statute. Of course, um, that statement is that any new and useful um, process machine and so forth, it's very uh, well known to, to those of us who practice in this area. And of course, there are three well-recognized uh, exceptions to uh, 101. Those are laws of nature, such as Einstein's E equals MC squared, natural phenomena like uh, discovering a mineral in the ground, and abstract ideas. So you might ask, if the statute has changed very little in uh, over 200 years, uh, then what has? Why has there been this shift in time uh, in, in the allowable scope of, of patentable subject matter? Well, certainly, it's the judicial interpretation that we've seen. For a very long time, <clears throat> uh, the Section 101 uh, provision was read very narrowly. Uh, and certainly, there was innovation over the last 200 years. But really, the biotech um, innovations and, and computers becoming a, a part of our daily lives challenged those boundary lines, uh, or challenged the boundary lines of the exceptions um, to the patent-eligible subject matter. So, for example, um, 
most people will recognize Diamond versus Chakrabarty. Um, this is a case uh, dealing with natural phenomena. Of course, Ananda Chakrabarty is a well-known microbiologist. When he was at General Electric in 1971, he developed what is effectively an oil-eating bacteria which had great applicability to oil spills. Now, he did this by genetically mod modifying four known species of oil metabolizing bacteria <clears throat> uh, to create a, a better solution than existed. He filed for a patent on, on this in 1972. Now, the PTO rejected the claims to the bacteria as living organisms. They did allow claims that, that were directed to um, using uh, the bacteria, but not to the bacteria itself. The CCPA, which is the predecessor to the Federal Circuit, uh, reversed the PTO, uh, and ultimately uh, it ended up before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court uh, affirmed the CCPA and, of course, uh, gave us a, a well-known statement that anything under the sun that is made by man is patent eligible. And what they did to reach that conclusion was to look to the legislative history. They found that Congress distinguished not between living and inanimate things, but between products of nature and human-made invention. Um, as a result of Chakrabarty, we saw uh, an increase um, in protection for biotechnology-related inventions. Uh, the Uncle Mouse, uh, of course, uh, which is a lab mouse, is a, a pretty well-known one. Of course, uh, this broadening of subject matter uh, was not only for biological subject matter, um, but also for processes. And there's three cases out of the Supreme Court known as the Trilogy uh, that really address the scope of patent-eligible subject matter uh, for processes and abstract ideas. These are, of course, Benson, Fluke, and Dyer. Now, beginning with Benson, and um, in Benson, uh, at issue was a process for converting binary coded decimal, which was widely used by digital computers of the time, to pure binary. Um, Benson and, and his, his partner Tabit applied for a patent claiming a method of programming a, a general purpose computer to carry out this conversion. And the PTO rejected this as un, an unpatentable mathematical algorithm and the CCPA reversed, um, the Supreme Court agreed and found that the claim was unpatentable because it, it simply implemented the math, well-known mathematical principle on a computer. Uh, the formula here had no practical application they held except with respect to, to with, uh, in conjunction with a computer, meaning that the sought-after claim would wholly preempt the formula itself. And as a result, we ended up with the machine or transformation test, where the court would look to uh, whether a, a claim uh, was directed to implementing a specific implementing machine or a transformation of substance to determine whether there was more than just the abstract idea itself. A few years later, the court considered uh, Fluke. Uh, Fluke had to do with monitoring conditions in a catalytic conversion process. Uh, factors like temperature and pressure change in such a process, and they are compared against threshold, thresholds um, called alarms uh, for safety and uh, efficiency reasons. Uh, Fluke applied for a patent claiming uh, a method that would automatically update the alarm uh, limits as conditions changed in the process. Uh, in Fluke's case, the claims were drafted to cover any use of the formula in a process involving catalytic chemical conversion of hydrocarbons. So the PTO uh, considered Fluke's application and rejected it. And the PTO felt that the only novel point was the formula, which under Benson would not be patent eligible. The CCPA reversed and found that the, the uh, concerns about preemption uh, didn't exist because this was limited to a specific uh, application. The Supreme Court sided with the PTO, however, and recognized that um, limiting an abstract idea to a particular field or adding what are essentially minor post-solution components was not enough to get over the threshold and make the concept patent eligible. The third case in the trilogy is uh, arguably the most well-known. This is Diamond versus Dyer. Of course, in, in Dyer, the invention uh, related to molding raw, uncured synthetic rubber into uh, precision products. 
course, time and temperature and um, and pressure uh, all uh, are relevant to to this process, and there were well-known uh, curing relationships. However, at the time, the machinery was not um, specialized enough to produce consistent results. Dyer and his partner Lutton ultimately um, uh, formulated a process for efficiently doing this that included programming a computer to carry out the process, monitor temperature, and ultimately open the rubber press automatically uh, when the you know, ideal conditions were met. Uh, they applied for, for a patent, of course. The PTO rejected this as a computer program under Benson, as they had done uh, with Fluke. The CCPA reversed um, and held that just because you added a computer didn't, take, didn't, didn't make the, the invention in this instance unpatentable. Here, it was, uh, the patent claims were directed to the overall curing process and not just the algorithm itself. The Supreme Court agreed and ultimately concluded that making use of the formula could be patentable um, in, in a larger overall process. As a result, software-related applications, of course, um, rapidly increased from this point. So fast forwarding about 20 years, we get to State Street Bank. Um, of course, State Street Bank uh, related to um, a, a patent, uh, a patented system called the hub and spoke system. It had to do with uh, mutual fund investing and taking advantage of uh, economies of scale and tax advantages for multiple funds. Uh, of course, at the end of each trading day, gains and losses uh, to, to the, the hub uh, feature had to be allocated to the individual funds uh, defined by the spokes. Um, the district court invalidated the patent as related to uh, a mathematical formula, an abstract idea. As an alternate basis for invalidation, the district court uh, relied on a so-called business method exception to patentability. When it was addressed by the Federal Circuit, um, the Federal Circuit actually took the opportunity uh, to address this, this so-called business method exception and clarified that there was no per se bar to patent eligibility for business methods. Um, they also, in this case, um, found that this was not an unpatentable formula because it, quote, produces a useful, concrete, and tangible result. So in one fell swoop, the Federal Circuit decision uh, gave us this new, this useful, concrete, tangible test, but also uh, opened the floodgates to business method patents. Now, why all that history? Well, and, and many of those cases are, are probably well known to you, but taking you know uh, those 20 years into account and looking at the, the timing uh, of State Street Bank in particular, this is a time when the Internet boo is booming um, and um, this extreme broadening of patent-eligible subject matter is evidenced by the growth in utility patent applications. In the 10 years prior to State Street Bank, there had been a 54% growth rate. In the 10 years following State Street Bank, it jumped to 88% um, year-over-year growth. And, of course, there were software and business method patents streaming into the PTO at this time. But, like all good things, they must come to an end, and the patent eligibility pendulum began to swing back the other way. And I mentioned there was 10 years uh, following State Street Bank in 1998. Well, in 2008, uh, we now see an attempt uh, to, to clarify uh, the standard for patent eligibility and, and in some ways to rein in uh, the test for patent eligibility. Uh, and we look first to the Bilski decisions. In the, in the Federal Circuit, this was an en banc review that was deeply divided. Um, in Bilski, uh, the, the patent claims were directed to an intermediary uh, buying and selling commodities in order to hedge risk. Um, I think most people are familiar with this patent. The PTO rejected the claims, um, and, uh, and, and the Federal Circuit uh, reviewed. Now, the court ultimately uh, said that the State Street Bank useful concrete tangible test should no longer be relied upon 
and if anything, they they stepped back from it a bit because they they argued that well, a process tied to a machine or transformation will generally produce a concrete tangible result, uh, and so it was never meant to state a a, t a new test or in some way supplant the machine or transformation test. As a result, uh, many view um, Bilski in the Federal Circuit as reiterating that the machine or transformation test is the sole test for patent eligible subject matter. Of course, this was reviewed by the Supreme Court a couple of years later. Now, the Supreme Court affirmed the actual outcome of uh, the Federal Circuit's ruling, but took the opportunity to revisit several patent eligible principles. This was a case that was looked upon, I think, with, with, with a degree of hope um, for some some clarity as to the test um, and some resolution as, in, as to the, the increased rate of software and business method patents. Uh, in Bilski, the Supreme Court, however, uh, trumped the Federal Circuit and said that the machine or transformation test is not, in fact, the sole test for patent-eligible subject matter, but it is a useful and important clue. Uh, they did agree that, that the useful, concrete, tangible recitation um, is not and was not an appropriate test, um, and agreed that there, but in some respects, agreed with uh, State Street Bank that there is no categorical exclusion of business method patents. So let me let me just jump in there for a second, Steve, and, and point out while you were speaking, one of the questions that came in on an earlier slide about State Street Bank was, you know, basically how was the State Street Bank decision? justified by prior Supreme Court rulings in that trilogy that you discussed. And I, I want to suggest uh, to you that uh, the answer is it probably wasn't, and that um, what we see here, at least uh, in my view, is one example of, of many that we can point to in which uh, the Federal Circuit makes a decision, and I don't recall right now whether there was a petition for cert uh, in State Street Bank or not, but to the extent that there was, that was much earlier on in the development of this additional line of, of uh, utility applications that we see being filed and the, the corresponding response from the judiciary. And so I, I would say that, in fact, there really wasn't a basis for that uh, in the Supreme Court precedent that existed at the time that the Federal Circuit made the State Street Bank ruling that it did. I actually recall there being you know, much ado in uh, the circles in which we travel about State Street Bank and the implications for that and what we see in Bilski and in subsequent cases that, that you're going to discuss is, I think, a reigning in of what we saw in State Street Bank. Yeah, I would tend to agree. The, 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 the trilogy and, and the cases that followed or imply the trilogy don't really support, I think, the State Street outcome. But it does, you know, as we pointed out, represent the, the sort of far end swing of that pendulum that, that really at that point the patentable subject matter had gotten so broad um, that, that it is a turning point in many respects. So uh, I think the next slide actually related to the, the commentary on this. Right. So returning to Bilski, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the Bilski decisions are, are, are quite long. Um, there's uh, quite a bit of disagreement. And for all the pages and pages of discussion, and I think attempts to uh, to harmonize the existing uh, case law with it, uh, by and large, the Bilski decisions fail to provide uh, clear guidance. Um, and, and patent eligibility at that point appeared to be contracting, but really had become murky. Um, the Supreme Court basically went so far as to invite restrictive tests for eligibility in its decision. Uh, which says a lot about um, about its impact. So the Supreme Court, um, yet a couple of years later, um, really did begin to bring patent eligibility into focus uh, with its Mayo decision. And from it, we get the two-part Mayo test. Um, briefly, um, Mayo uh, involved um, patents that were related to calibrating proper dosage of, uh, of drugs treating immune autoimmune diseases. And uh, what they found was that different people metabolize these drugs at different rates, and based on the level of, of metabolites in the patient's blood, um, there, it may be an indication of, of under or over treatment. 
And so the patents were directed to um, to not only uh, monitoring that, but um, uh, making a determination as to whether to increase or decrease the dosage. Uh, in the district courts, uh, the patents were invalidated as basically relating to the natural phenomena of the metabolization. The Federal Circuit uh, reversed. Uh, now, in the Supreme Court, uh, the claimed invention relied on the natural response to the drug, but the question was really whether there was a larger patentable process, like we saw in Dyer, where the calculations and formula were part of the overall curing process, or whether the claims were, in fact, directed to little more than the unpatentable subject matter itself. And, and ultimately, the court found that the, patent, the claims here were patent ineligible. And they looked to the additional steps uh, that were added on top of, in this case, the natural phenomena, and found that these were routine activities that doctors performed, measuring and monitoring uh, the reaction to the drug and they were not sufficient to, um, to transform the natural correlation into a patentable uh, application. Now, on the next slide, what we've got here is um, a flow chart uh, of the two-part Mayo test. We've taken this <clears throat> from the PTO's interim guidance on subject matter eligibility. And of course, the thrust of the Mayo decision itself is really captured in steps 2A and, and 2B, the lower two diamonds. And of course, in step one, or I should say step 2A, um, we look to um, whether uh, the invention, the claim, uh, falls within one of the three traditionally recognized exceptions. And then we ask ourselves whether um, it recites uh, additional elements that are significant enough um, to make that transformational leap into uh, eligible subject matter. Now, just, um, just a year later, uh, we see an application of Mayo uh, in the, the, the Myriad case um, relating to uh, gene patents. Of course, um, the patents here are uh, related to uh, genes and certain genetic mutations that indicate a risk of breast cancer. Uh, and um, Myriad had, had patent claims directed both to the genes themselves and to the synthetic cDNA um, that could be used for uh, diagnostics. Um, and the court looked uh, to Chakrabarty, uh, we discussed earlier, um, for the distinction that, you know, on the one hand, simply discovering and isolating a product of nature, that being the genes themselves, is not enough to satisfy Section 101. And in that respect, um, those claims failed step 2B. Um, but the human-made uh, cDNA is itself not a product of nature. Um, and so it never even reaches that branch. Um, it satisfies eligibility at step 2A of the Mayo test. Um, and so in uh, Myriad, we see um, uh, two examples, really, of the test at work and are given um, an important clarification uh, for genetic study and innovation. So looking to the impact of Mayo, you know, Mayo provided the guidance that had long been sought after. Um, you know, we are at this point 15 years out, uh, 12 year, uh, excuse me, 14 years out from State Street Bank. Um, this follows the Bilski decisions by some years. And so it really does give the guidance um, that, that um, the, the patent practitioners sought. Um, but what really was the, the impact of Mayo on patent litigation? Well, simply said, I. I I think we would we would we would posit that it did not have a substantial and immediate impact on litigation. Um, it, it did not have that that um, immediate shock and awe um, uh, result that we've seen with Alice in the last uh, year or so. And you know why? Well, perhaps it was uh, poor timing. The AIA uh, was due to come into effect a few months later. Uh, a lot of people were looking to and considering the impact of the AIA on their, their strategies and their portfolios. Um, and perhaps some considered this to be um, limited um, just to biological sciences uh, because it dealt with uh, natural phenomena. That's right. So then we get to Alice. Um, Alice answered, uh, I'd say, quite definitively any lingering questions about 
the applicability of the Mayo test uh, beyond uh, the biological context. Um, Alice on its face is directed to um, uh, addresses the issue of abstract ideas and patent eligibility. Um, but I think, as we'll see, it's, it's done much more than that. Of course, uh, the patents themselves at, at issue in Alice had to do with mitiga mitigating settlement risk uh, using a, an intermediary. Um, and primarily, this was used in currency transactions and uh, creating a clearinghouse uh, uh, for, for these things. Um, the district court, of course, held these claims as, as invalid uh, and doing nothing more than uh, embodying the abstract idea. Uh, the Federal Circuit um, initially reversed um, and then decided to, to rehear the case en banc uh, and, and still um, and ultimately affirmed the district court. Uh, I think most people remember this decision from the Federal Circuit not so much for what it, it said but what it didn't say. It was an extremely divided court. Um, there were um, many, many decisions. Uh, there was a great deal of, of discord. Uh, amongst the, the judges as to what the proper test was. In, including um, Judge Radar, not Radar, so apologies for that typo there on that slide. I also will note at this point that um, for those of you that are keeping score at home and that care about uh, the New York CLE code, uh, we've got a flag there to let everyone know that the New York CLE code for this CLE is 520, 520. Message from our sponsors. There you go. All right. So, um, so Alice applied Mayo, right? On, on review in the Supreme Court uh, of, of the Alice case, um, the Supreme Court looked at uh, the three traditional exclusions, the patent uh, eligible subject matter, and explained that the, the concern driving these exclusionary principles really comes down to preemption. Uh, and of course, under 101, there, there must be a distinction between patents that claim the building blocks of human ingenuity, as the court said, and those that integrate them into something more. Uh, and what we saw, uh, what we see in, in Alice, of course, is the application of Mayo to the Alice claims. And they found, of course, that the claims were directed to uh, the abstract idea of intermediate, intermediated settlement, uh, drawing from uh, similar claims in, in Bilski, and then asking the question, is there an inventive concept sufficient to transform this abstract idea into patent-eligible subject matter. And, of course, they found that implementation on a general-purpose computer um, carrying out otherwise conventional steps uh, does not get there. Um, and in so doing, of course, the main takeaway is that Alice, um, Alice makes clear that there is a definitive test for Section 101, that it is the two-part uh, Mayo test, uh, regardless of, of which of the Three, you know, traditional exceptions um, is is under analysis, and um, interestingly, uh, you know, if we recall that Benson, back in the late 70s, uh, that's the case that related to converting binary numbers um, on a general purpose computer, and actually used that that terminology, general purpose computer. We actually see the same reasoning conclusion um, in Alice that simply implementing an abstract idea on a general purpose computer is not patent eligible subject matter. And of course, um, the last few pages of Alice really are directed to the discussion of Benson and Fluke and drawing directly from them. And, and so I think what we see is, is that there's a full circle and 35 years of, of patent eligibility uh, jurisprudence, uh, there actually is a, a complete cycle. Of course, Alice has reverberated through the, the patent field, um, and, uh, and there is something uh, special about Alice. Um, in, indeed, there's been a dramatic increase um, in Section 101 patent eligibility as a real and effective uh, defense uh, in litigation. We see that in the, the fourfold increase in uh, Rule 12 and, and Rule 56 motions based, in, based on Section 101. That's right, and, and I, we sort of highlighted that in, in red there just to, to emphasize the point that, it, at least in, in my practice, and I think in Steve's as well, we, we are really seeing um, the impact of Alice, and in particular the Federal Circuit's follow-on ultra-mercial decision uh, come to bear from a Rule 12 
standpoint. Uh, naturally, you, you know, you could raise this at Rule 56 later on in the case, but for cases in which there are patents being asserted by traditional non-practicing entities or patent assertion entities, um, Rule 12 motions, or in particular Rule 12C motions, 12C and 12B6 we've seen filed, uh, have become viable options to uh, really end the case before it has begun in earnest. Uh, we have seen that even in jurisdictions as swift as the Eastern District of Virginia uh, in the Alexandria Division, we have seen judges that on a motion uh, for Rule 12 dismissal under Alice, uh, that those dismissals are being being granted. Um, we see that despite the fact uh, that uh, we, at the same time, uh, see Federal Circuit decisions such as Teva come out that say, well, wait a minute, um, if, there is a, if there is a claim construction issue in which a district judge has to make uh, some finding of fact or make a credibility determination that the Federal Circuit should, um, should give that or accord that some deference on appeal, uh, the intersection is very interesting of that argument with whether it really is appropriate to consider uh, on a Rule 12 level uh, the, the 101 patent eligibility question because uh, the, the party that is asserting the patent almost uh, naturally will assert that at the very least uh, there are claim construction issues that require uh, some sort of analysis about what the level of one of ordinary skill in the art uh, would know uh, about those claim terms and therefore doesn't make Rule 11 appropriate, uh, excuse me, Rule 12 appropriate at that time, but we're seeing district judges do that uh, regularly and as a result, uh, lawyers, those of you on this call are paying attention to what's happening, which way the wind is blowing, and so we see this increase in Rule 12 motions that are being filed under Section 101. Right, and you know, even more so just than just the rate of filings under under Rule 12 and and, and Rule 56 as well, we we've seen what what we sort of coined the Alice effect, and and, and what that is, of course, is is the particular zeal for um, for invalidating patents. Um, both in the courts and in the PTO, um, you know, and will the um, will the Alice effect wane? Right. So, you know, there's about a 10% uh, uptick in the grant rate that we see after Alice um, than that we saw uh, between the time of Mayo and Alice. Of course, recall that Alice adopted Mayo's test, so. Um, you know, one one would expect there to be some consistency between those two periods, but it goes to show uh, the particular impact of Alice um, in that 10%. Now, you know, will that wane? Yes, we think that it will wane uh, over time, and, and that will come in a couple of forms. One is that uh, courts will become more familiar with the Section 101 questions. They'll have more experience in applying that two-part test. And, and what we've seen thus far is that it's really step 2B uh, that's the issue. Is there the inventive concept? You know, are the recitations in the claim enough to, to have that successful transformation into patent-eligible material? Um, the other thing um, that we, we think we'll see is, is that um, courts that, of course, are most active in the patent, uh, patent realm uh, they have had very little of uh, this um, Alice effect. There has, has tended to be a consistency in those fora, and so we think that's an indicator um, that time and experience and, and application will um, help to help to uh, settle the Alice effect a bit. So uh, we've we've spent some time talking about Alice uh, and its its impact, and we, we've seen that impact. Let's now turn and, and talk about another prong of our, of our discussion points today uh, and talk about attorney's fees under Section 285. Uh, this is another instance in which, uh, as an overlay to the AIA and, and some of the other things that we're seeing uh, matriculate through uh, the legislative process now, this is an opportunity that the, the judiciary has taken to, uh, to further address and respond to 
um, concerns about NPE litigation and the costs of litigation uh, that have occurred. Uh, you're, you're familiar with Section 285 uh, of, of Title 35. It's, it's very simple. It says that the court in exceptional cases may award reasonable attorney's fees to the prevailing party. And this is uh, something that uh, historically uh, the, the courts uh, have not addressed in the scrupulous way in which we're seeing more recently uh, post-octane fitness uh, in deciding exactly what it is that is exceptional. What does this uh, the section of the statute mean when, in fact, the normal course is that parties cover their own costs, except for extreme circumstances. Now, historically, uh, courts have considered the totality of the circumstances, and uh, as recently as about a decade ago, the Federal Circuit announced uh, in Brooks Furniture that a case is exceptional in, in really very limited circumstances for the purposes of Section 285. Um, one is when there's been uh, material inappropriate conduct in procuring the patent in the first place uh, or during the litigation. And I would uh, suggest to you that that is almost something that uh, would fall within the category of the court's ability to, to use its inherent authority uh, to sanction a party under uh, Section uh, 1927 of Title 28 anyway. And so the real key from a, from a 285 standpoint under the, the Brooks Furniture line of cases was that second bullet point there, that the litigation either was, well, both, was brought in subjective bad faith and was objectively baseless. There was a subjective prong and an objective prong and both of those prongs, to the extent that they were going to be proven, had to be proven by clear and convincing evidence. That made Section 285 essentially, uh, in 99.9% in .9 of cases, a, a hollow act. That's virtually impossible to prove at a clear and convincing level. Uh, and so uh, what happened? Uh, the, the, the standard was reset in the octane fitness case, and the Supreme Court um, did what we have seen the Supreme Court do over and over and over again in the last approximately 20 years or so, and that is to slap the Federal Circuit on the hand and say that these rigid tests that you are applying, these bright line rules, don't work. And even though you patent lawyers believe that you are special, you're, you're actually not. And this area of the law is no different than any other area of the law. And here, they said that an exceptional case really is one that simply stands out from others with respect to its substantive strength or the litigation conduct of the parties. Now, of course, the devil is always in the details. And so what we're seeing uh, and what we will continue to see is district courts struggle with how to apply that rule and what that means in real life, something that stands out from other cases. Uh, in an uh, environment in which the vast majority of cases that are being filed are not competitor on competitor, fight to the death, you know, counter and cross claims for patents, but rather an NPE case, how do you demonstrate what stands out from others? How do you apply that in in actual uh, cases to give the parties the proper motivation and the proper guidance about when to file um, cases and what the consequences may be, but also to not chill um, parties that have a legitimate right to come before the court and seek that redress for fear of being saddled with some huge uh, attorney's fee bill at the end of the day because you didn't win but you thought you had a, a reason shot. Now, again, it's a totality of the circumstances test. It's to be applied on a case-by-case -case basis, which, of course, means that you can look to guidance in other cases, but every case may very well be different. Uh, importantly, uh, the Supreme Court said here that there's no statutory basis for the clear and convincing evidence, a burden of proof, standard that was being applied under the Brooks Furniture line of cases, 
and that the appropriate standard here is preponderance of the evidence. Um, there's been a lot of talk uh, in the news, for those of you that are sports fans, about deflate gate. I have to do that because my colleague here, Steve, started off in Boston. But there's a lot of talk in the news about the Ted Wells report and the more likely than not whether something happened. Uh, in this setting, that is a perfectly appropriate standard to apply, according to the Supreme Court, uh, and it's the standard that was the right one. So uh, there was, of course, uh, at the same time, on the same day that Octane Fitness came out, a companion case that was taken up on cert uh, at the same time, the Highmark case, which essentially says at the end of the day uh, that the de novo standard that is to be that was traditionally applied um, wasn't the proper one uh, and that uh, octane uh, fitness left it to the determination of the district court's discretion and that the proper measure of review uh, is an abuse of discretion and so wh where do we end up after octane and highmark come out uh, that it is uh, a preponderance of the evidence uh, and that it's reviewed for abuse of discretion. So naturally, uh, good lawyers see that and they respond and they adjust fire. And so we see, uh, I'm sure, uh, a, 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 an overwhelming number of Section 285 motions that are being filed, but they're also being granted at a much higher rate. Um, and the Federal Circuit Bar Association uh, provided data that said that it's, those motions are being granted at almost three times the rate as in the year preceding uh, Octane, uh, and that uh, in the first quarter of this year, 50% uh, of the Section 285 motions that had been filed by accused infringers, uh, in fact, were granted. Ahmed, while you were doing that presentation, we had a, a very good question come in. Um, the question was was whether the exceptional case uh, inquiry is um, where the case stands out uh, from amongst the rest, whether that's um, particular to patent cases or it it's, uh, stands out from all cases. Uh, that that's a that's an excellent question. Whoever posed that question, and I I would suggest to you um, that to the extent that be, because this is within the patent statute, it's in Title 35 that largely speaking, that it would be whether it stands out from patent cases or cases of similar ilk that relate to those issues. Uh, and so that's really going to be the standard that courts are going to apply. Having said that, um, as it relates to litigation misconduct, I can easily foresee a situation in which a district court might draw from its experience or from other case law addressing litigation misconduct issues that have occurred in cases that don't have anything to do with patents per se because that's not going to be subject matter specific. If part of the basis for the court's finding that the case is exceptional has to do with misbehavior in discovery, it shouldn't matter whether that is happening in a patent case as opposed to any other kind of case. And so uh, I think that courts will be able to, to take either, either side of that, and it depends on what the finding is that, that the court is, is making. Uh, let me get the next slide. So um, what I want to do is just take a few minutes and talk about some of the cases that we have seen that address the octane standard and that I wanted to flag for you uh, so that you all might see some of the things that courts are doing. There certainly have been a number of 285 motions that have been granted that I would say, notwithstanding the standard that they stand out from others, are sort of what you would expect from a patent law standpoint. You took a position that was inher inherently unreasonable either at the time that you filed the suit or at some point in the suit. Um, looking at some of these cases, what you will see a lot of them uh, will find that if a, a party did not take a, an unreasonable position at the time that the suit was filed, but once the court issued its claim construction, that in light of that claim construction, no reasonable party could go forward and press its infringement allegations. And so 
where a party ultimately, a defendant, uh, ultimately prevails on summary judgment or at trial, we see Octane Fitness 285 motions being granted and fees being awarded from the time of the Markman ruling on forward. And so it's not an all or none proposition. Uh, quickly, some of the cases that we've seen in, say, the last six months or so. One that is notable um, and that uh, may be an outlier or may be a trendsetter is the Romag Fasteners case from uh, the District of Connecticut. And the reason that I have flagged this one is because uh, the district court here actually awarded fees against the accused infringer for arguing a, an invalidity position on claim construction and further uh, on, during the case in summary judgment that a claim term was indefinite and that by doing so, when it was unreasonable to do so, uh, the party had unnecessarily prolonged and increased the cost of the case, and that that, uh, in effect, rendered this case exceptional, notwithstanding the fact that the defendant actually had prevailed on some of its counterclaims. And so I personally think this may be an outlier, but it certainly is something that uh, we have to be aware of when we are advising our clients or when um, those of you that are in-house are considering what positions to take in litigation, that at least one district judge has, has dinged a defendant for taking a, an invalidity position that they believed was unreasonable. Uh, a few others uh, of more recent vintage in the last two months or so, uh, the first is the, the Kilopass uh, technology case. This is the latest of a number of decisions that have come out uh, this is on remand after uh, a Federal Circuit uh, decision, but what was notable here uh, is that uh, the district court addressed the, the impact of Octane on an alternate fee arrangement that uh, the defense counsel had engaged in with uh, the, the defendant. And, and this was particularly interesting because that, of course, raises the question of what fees are considered reasonable. Um, do you use the lodestar amount that you would typically use if a, uh, a firm uh, is on a straight hourly as opposed to some sort of a fixed fee uh, uh, arrangement? What do you do, for example, if you've got a firm uh, that has a capped fee with some bonuses or some kickers uh, how are district judges going to deal with that? This is a case in which the district judge uh, treated this in very similar fashion to if the firm was handling the case on a flat hourly rate. And so you could end up in a situation where perhaps there might even be a windfall. Um, another one uh, that came out more recently was the, uh, the Brilliant Optical Solutions case versus Comcast in which fees were awarded against an Acacia entity uh, for unreasonably continuing suit after a license had taken effect that would have absolved some of the accused products. What was notable here uh, is that Acacia was actually the parent. Um, the, the entity that actually had filed suit um, didn't really have uh, any employees, didn't have any physical property, didn't have any assets. Uh, the district court actually awarded fees against uh, the, the parent in any event. And, and lastly, let me touch briefly on the O-plus technologies case, which many of you probably saw uh, that is a federal circuit case in which um, the federal circuit um, found that the district court had abused its discretion by finding a case exceptional and yet refusing to award fees. And that's notable because, as we saw earlier, uh, what Section 285 says is that the district court, uh, the court in exceptional circumstances may award reasonable attorney's fees. And so um, finding the case exceptional and awarding fees arguably are untethered under the statute, but if the, if the federal circuit is going to apply the law to say that if you find uh, the case exceptional, you must apply fee, uh, you must award fees unless there's some articulation why you shouldn't, um, that you know, puts the onus on us as counsel to, to prepare our case accordingly to try to get the court to, to rule in such a way that when it gets presented to the Federal Circuit, um, we, uh, we've, we've teed it up properly. Um, let's go to the, the next 
slide. Um, just sort of as a summary, Octane, of course, lowered the bar of fees, but um, uh, there are practical realities here. Uh, e even if you get fees, uh, you still have to be able to collect them. Uh, many NPEs are, are shells, and they don't have any assets. Uh, notwithstanding what we just discussed in the, uh, the Brilliant Optical case, that could be an issue. That could be a challenge. One of the things that Steve and I has heard, have heard uh, is that, that can be done that, that NPEs or patent assertion entities are considering is upon an award of fees to declare bankruptcy uh, and to just make a mess of the entire situation and to make it difficult to recover those fees. Uh, there's some legislation that's been proposed uh, that would require a plaintiff to post a bond uh, at filing, which um, the law of unintended consequences may may come into play there for bore because that may present another hurdle for those who legitimately seek the court's redress to uh, to, to have a difficult time coming into into court. So let's now talk about the uh, the intersection of Alice and Octane and some of the things that we see. So some of you might be wondering just just how is how how, how is the Alice case in the in the Octane case, how do these two things relate to each other? And, and we, would, we would argue that they're not so different. Um, now, granted, one has to do with patent-eligible subject matter, the other with, with fee shifting. But at the end of the day, what they really represent is, is judicial reform efforts. So, like Alice, Octane, um, you know, we'll get some clarity over time. It's a little hard um, to, um, to determine uh, just yet whether, for instance, the lower standard uh, for obtaining fees uh, will impact whether defendants take cases all the way to trial. Um, you know, that will come over time. But certainly uh, with Alice and Octane, this will make uh, plaintiffs think twice about uh, about filing their case. And certainly um, both should reduce the, the filings of weak patent cases, um, whether you're an NP or, or, or an operating company. And, of course, um, you know, filing the dot-com bus, uh, you know, we would say that there were a lot of software and me business method patents on the market uh, to be acquired, and um, certainly Alice and, and Octane, you know, force a reevaluation of the strength of those portfolios, and that ultimately these cases, really, the thing that draws, brings them together is that they address the same goals as the AIA, which is really, on the one hand, to improve the quality of patents and to reduce unnecessary litigation. And coming back to um, coming back to our compare contrast, um, you know the, the the courts have introduced meaningful uh, reform uh, through these recent decisions, and and I think we would like to say that they're complementary to the AIA reforms, um, that, that they don't trump them, um, but that they work together to to achieve the same goals. And of course, some of the the, the reaction will temper over time, uh, and uh, you know less new new innovation. Test us once again. Let me just interject here. I, I see that it's two o'clock Eastern. We've probably got uh, another five to eight minutes just for those who who may be looking at the time. So, so looking ahead uh, to uh, where we where we are, where we where we're going, um, there certainly is pending reform. Um, uh, we've, we we know about the various acts that are that are floating through Congress right now. There was a report I think on a Daily News that there at least they don't expect there to be any activity uh, on the, the Patent Act, which is sort of the latest thing percolating through uh, at least until, I think, the end of the month. And so we're not going to see anything imminently, but it's still uh, percolating through until we might see something this year. Um, so what do we see as we are uh, sort of looking at what's going to happen in district court? Uh, so what we think is going to happen is both Mayo and Octane standards are going to be refined uh, there obviously are going to be cases that are applying those standards, and so we will, we will see case-specific examples of where Mayo and where Octane Fitness may, uh, where the line may be drawn and where there are boundaries. Um, uh, we do uh, certainly see some initial guidance from the Federal Circuit in the ultra-mercial uh, opinion that came out last fall. Uh, and the DDR Holdings case that came out last fall as well. Last fall as well. Uh, we've got some guidance there, and district courts are looking to those, and we're seeing opinions that come out, um, you know, weekly. Uh, and uh, one question that we got, uh, I think, before this started, related to what 
you know, what we see or what possibilities there are for claim drafting uh, to deal with uh, the impact of Alice. And uh, neither Steve nor I are, are prosecutors, but one of the things that we certainly both have seen is that uh, the Federal Circuit's DDR holdings uh, is providing a roadmap for how you distinguish your claims and say, this adds something extra. This satisfies part two of the test and gets us around the problems that were pointed out in Mayo and Alice. Right, and, and, and to that same question, um, you know, we went back and we looked at, I think if, in Alice, there's very specific language that, that, that said, well, in that instance, the petitioner emphasized specific hardware and gave examples like data processing system, communications controller, data storage unit, but the Supreme Court found that to be generic. Looking at DDR, you know, in DDR, what they found was a solution that was directed to a particular problem in a particular technical context. And, and so perhaps um, when we get to tailored solutions, even to the extent that they may take advantage of some generic uh, components, that may be uh, a way through the woods uh, on that drafting question. Great. So uh, we have, have run slightly over our time. We, we appreciate the questions that we have been receiving uh, in real time. I think we were able to address almost all of them. There may be one or two that we did not that we will, will follow up uh, with you uh, offline to make sure those, those questions get answered. Uh, we, we do appreciate your time. That's all the time that we have uh, for today. Uh, we thank you for attending this webinar, and for those that may be interested in uh, getting a copy of the slides or in somebody uh, seeing an on-demand replay, those will be posted uh, within about two business days uh, at fishlitigationblog.com. Uh, if you have any questions regarding CLE credit, uh, you can email uh, Ellen Makarovich of our firm uh, on an email address that I'm told uh, is on your screen. Um, for those that are in New York and New Jersey, again, please make a note of the course code, which is 520, and include it on the New York CLE form that will be forwarded in a follow-up email. Uh, as a reminder, that code is only for the New York and New Jersey attorneys because they have different requirements than the other states. Uh, finally, again, watch for our next webinar on appeals from IPRs, which is scheduled for Wednesday, June 17th, uh, and visit Fish Litigation Blog dot com for the latest information uh, on hot topics in patent law. Uh, thanks for your time. Uh, take care. Have a good day.